I'm a very, everyone who does this podcast, who listens or watches it, and this is available on YouTube, you know I'm very holistic as it pertains to golf improvement. And I found Kent Osborne on social media by the grace of God. And I've been hooked to your timeline, Kent, and now I get to feature you on my show. Welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you very much, Mark. Appreciate being here. Uh, you know what? Before I let you introduce yourself, I, I, I just want to make a statement, get your take. Um, I find it fascinating how the more I do this podcast, and we're now into eight seasons, I think it is, that more insight is coming from folks who aren't necessarily golf instructors or golf coaches. They're, they're, they're folks mm-hmm. that come to the game and they bring different skills to instruction, to learning, to growth. And, and you certainly appear to me to, to be one of those. Well, that's, uh, you know, it would be, be nice to think that I, that I was one of those. I, I think that uh, it's not uncommon for, uh, for breakthroughs in, in any industry or any perspective to come from outside that world. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think when you become an expert in something, um, you know, you, you kind of buy the worldview or see the world through those lenses, so to speak, mm-hmm. and possibly... Um, you know, from a golf point of view, if you if you love the game like I do, if you're way down the rabbit hole, you know, it's possible that you could have, you know, a, a perspective that I, I wouldn't say is any better, but might might add value or might give might give someone an opportunity to look at their approach to the game in a in a different way. So um yeah. Well, I think the well, common denominator deep down is that we're all human beings. Who are endeavoring for human mm. personal growth, then obviously folks who download this one to, you know, enjoy some growth in their game of golf. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Well said. With well that said. said. With, with that said, let me let me introduce you, um, Ken Os- Osborne. Tell the viewers on YouTube and the listeners on uh, audio a um, little bit about you, please. Well, um, I started my professional career uh, as a mental health counselor. Mm-hmm. And um, did that for a number of years, became uh, good at it, I guess, uh, became a clinical director in a mental health center, but I had a background in sports. Yeah. I grew up very passionate about hockey. I wanted to be a professional hockey player that uh, for a number of reasons, that not the least of which is lack of ability. It and, didn't work out. And folks, yeah. Kent, if you might pick up in the accent for our global audience is from Canada, hence the hockey, the ice hockey. Yes, and if I say a a number of times, then that will uh, <laughs> that will give it away. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I I had this hockey background. I, I get into uh, you know mental health counseling, and um, always had the idea in the back of my mind that I would like to work in sports. I'd like to work with hockey players, and so because I had uh, had a background, I I had the opportunity to start working with uh, elite level amateurs and then professionals, and then. Uh, spent a couple of years in the National Hockey League with the Detroit Red Wings being there uh, in the sports psychology role or mental skills coach, if you want to call it that. Mm-hmm. Um, that was probably 30 some years ago. So um, at that time, the, the the whole leadership development, executive coaching thing was just starting to open up. And it was a it was really a tremendous opportunity for me and my family to, uh, you know, to throw my hat into the ring there. Uh, and to offer something in that in that capacity, and that's mostly what I've what I've done. I still do some work, although I'm mostly retired now. I still do some work through the Stockholm School of Economics in one of their leadership development programs. All right. Um, so, but then uh, you know, I was able to be kind of semi-retired and as a younger guy, as a 50 year old, and I got into golf. Um, I was a recreational softball player, hurt my shoulder really badly, had no interest in golf and playing golf up until that point. Uh, some of the guys on my team were, were golfers. And when I could no longer play recreational softball, it was kind of like a hole for me, uh, that I needed to fill. And mm-hmm. uh, out I went to start to play golf and uh, fell down the rabbit hole. <laughs> and the bug bit you inside said, yeah, right? <laughs> okay. oh, yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, but the you... interesting thing for me uh, in terms of in terms of my uh, story is that I played softball on a team that could arguably be the worst softball team in North America. <laughs> and and we would gather around a guy's truck after every game, we have, have a beer, and we'd give out a trophy for the guy who made the worst air. 
<laughs> and we'd all have a laugh and you know like so that's where we were at but you get the same guys on the golf course and they were they were frustrated never satisfied uh, you know constantly complaining mm -hmm. constantly talking negatively to themselves they were no better at golf than they were they were at baseball but there was something about this this game that that in a way brought out the worst in them so I looked at this and I thought, hey, you know, uh, hey, Yoda, you know, you'll, uh -huh. you, you'll rise above all this and you, you'll be a poster boy for uh, for happiness on the golf course. And and that was true for a little while. But once I started to get, quote unquote, better, you know, it could break 100, could break 90, could shoot in the low 80s. Did you become a tournament I, winner? Yeah, I, I started to fall into the same trap that everybody else did. I started to get into the whole uh you know the the biggest traps that i see for recreational golfers like me which is you know i wasn't i wasn't happy about a good shot i i flatlined after a good shot i i'd say to my buddies hey great swing or 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 nice try if they missed a 25 foot butt but i wouldn't be happy about it um so you know finally it dawned on me that i needed to you know reach back into what I knew about uh, about the mind and what specifically what I knew about this field of emotional intelligence and, and attempt to take a better approach to uh, to, to golf. And, um, you know, I did that. I shared it with a couple of my pals and 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 one of my buddies said, hey, you know, you sh you should share the stuff on Twitter. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I did. I did. So here and here we are. Yeah, you're speaking to the world on uh, the On The Mark podcast. Hey, uh, yeah. so you've written an ebook, uh, which you sent me. I've not got into it just yet, but I promise you I'm going to read it because I adopt this sort of an attitude to it. And I find it so curious because, you know, I was a decent player way back and then I became a full-time golf instructor. And it occurred to me, you know, into my journey as a golf teacher that the better the golfer got, the more, as you say, the happiness or the joy of it all began to diminish because when you're beginning and you hit like one good shot, it's like miraculous and it's so much fun, yeah. but then the better yeah. you hit, it's not hitting good shots. It's more avoiding errors to when, when you're really good, like the scratch golf is trying to avoid errors where the beginner golf is just trying to hit a few good, uh, nice shots. So the mindset becomes inherently negative because you're searching for the fall down all the time. Cause that's the area you got to clean up. Yeah. For sure. I mean, I, I think that if you were, if I was to go out, I'm going to play men's night tonight. And if I happen to be in a group with a, with a scratch player and a, and a guy who's a, a 20 handicap, chances are the 20 handicap will have more fun. <laughs> the scratch player will need to shoot a certain number for him to, to him to, for him to enjoy himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, you talk about being playful when you, play or you endeavor to be playful when you play the game mm. and lacked playful because it it's sound because golf is a game okay so i love i love the moniker playful and you broke playful down into being physically relaxed being mentally calm and being mm. emotionally free mm. i'd love just to unpack those three elements a little bit and then we'll dive into uh the topic that i wanted to talk about please Sure. Well, that, that's that's kind of the heart of it, because I think that when, when I looked at when, when I attempted to take a, an approach that would be more fulfilling for me mm -hmm. as a recreational player. One of the things I saw from mainstream golf psychology is the the common understanding that golf is a physical and mental game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would say that's incorrect. Because okay. golf is a physical, mental, and emotional game. Your emotions are not a subset of your mental game. Your emotions are not something that just happens to ha happen on the side. They're, they're absolutely pivotal. And they're an equal part of this three threefold thing from my point of view. And I believe that the wisest thing that a recreation, an avid recreational player can do is put his emphasis on the emotional side of things. Put Put his emphasis on being emotionally free out there. Be okay. Because I would say that that one of the problems is that we encounter is we attempt to follow the PGA Tour model. Mm -hmm. And we attempt to follow 
you know, the shrinks who work with the PGA tour guys and gals mm -hmm. on the LPGA tour. And that model is essentially focused on routines, think box, play box, if I can use those terms. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. But the, the reality is that that your your emotions come from a deeper place than that. And, and, and you can't routine your way, at least in my experience, you can't routine your way out of frustration. You can't routine your way out of anxiety. So you what you what you show up with on the golf course and as, as an emotional base, what you show up with on the golf course, that's going to color how you experience the game. So Phil Mickelson last year at the at the PGA Championship, when he's standing on the side and he's doing his, his, his breathing exercises. That's great for Phil because underneath that he's got he's got the confidence and he's got the emotional stability based on 30 years of experience mm -hmm. to use that kind of mental technique to help him get into more of a peak zone. But if you're if if you're oh, absolutely overwhelmed or absolutely frustrated, you can breathe all you want on, on the tee box and it's not going to fundamentally make a difference for you from from my point of view. So what I what I got into myself and, and what I recommend for the recreational player is put some emphasis on rituals, not routines. Rituals are what you do off the golf course. Uh -huh. Thinking occurs on the golf course. Your emotions are something that you, that you bring with you to the golf course. The analogy that I would use or the comparator that I would use is basically, um, Emotions are to the mental game what your physical fitness is to your your golf swing. Okay, yeah. So if if I got on the tee today and I think to myself, you know what, man, I've I, I've I've lost ten to fifteen yards on my drive. Uh, maybe I'm not as strong as I was last year. Maybe I'm not quite as flexible as I was last year. I need well. There's nothing I can do about that in that round. I can, I can have that realization. I can start to go to the gym. I can start to do some yoga. I can start to do things off the golf course that will help me a month or three months or six months from now be in the kind of, make the kind of swing that I want to make. Mm -hmm. But I can't fix it in that, in that round. So the emotions are the same. If, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm wanting to be on the golf course feeling grateful, feeling relaxed feeling that i'm emotionally free feeling that i'm just you know in in love with the game and in love with how it feels when it hits a great shot i have to cultivate that off the course i'm not going to be able to think my way into it on the golf course that, and that's probably the that's probably the, the the place where i i part ways with the with mainstream golf psychology i think well you speaking to me and I am my mind spinning going, you know, that makes so much sense. And it brings to mind a quote that I read of yours on your website, uh, scratchattitude.com. If folks want to go and check it out, you wrote there, when it comes to personal performance, feelings are as powerful as thoughts for, uh, in other words, you cannot think positive if you feel negative. And 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 that that makes so much sense when you when you wrote that and now when you color it with the like well I can breathe deeply all I like if there's mayhem going on in my emotions I'm going to remain in the same place. Yes, yes, and your 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 emotions are habitual pat like the way I look at the mind the the, the emotions come from your subconscious. Mm -hmm. That they're rooted in habitual patterns that are no different than, you know, the way I'm sitting here in the, my chair in my chair, or the way I brush my teeth in the morning, or the, you know, the the little patterns in my in my speech. Yeah, you know, that they're outside of your conscious control. Now you can cultivate a more positive state, and I think that, um, you know. Part of developing what I call a scratch attitude is taking a little bit of time to cultivate that. Now, there's a few things that you can, a few rituals that you can do that will help, help significantly in that regard. The most important one from my point of view is using a journal. Okay. Using a journal before you play and after you play. 
Now, wh when I'm talking about rituals here, I I'm not talking about putting yourself into a three hour trance. Um, I'm talking about taking three to five minutes before a round and taking three to five minutes after a round. And in the three to five minutes before a round, I just take a blank, my blank journal, mm -hmm. and I answer three questions. I ask myself, what am I grateful for today? Okay. And the second question. And today it could be, you know, my wife. It could be the quality of the golf course. It could be the fact that I live eight minutes away from the course. It could be the fact that I'm still above ground. It could be any number of those things. But I want to connect with that feeling. Yeah. Okay. And the second thing I ask myself is, what do I love about golf? <laughs> okay. Well, what I love about golf is I love it when I hit it pure. Every now and then, now that's pure for me, not pure for Rory. Mm -hmm. But when I hit it pure, I, I, and I love that. And I love getting up and down. I mean, I just, I, I love that. Right. And I love being with, I love being out there with, with my buddies and, you know, trying to take 20 bucks off them mm -hmm. at a NASA. I mean, I, I, I love that whole thing. Mm -hmm. And the third thing I'll, so I connect with that feeling. And the third thing I ask myself may, is... May I interrupt? Because yeah. the folks watching sure. YouTube are probably, well, they're paying attention to you, but if they did glance over to the other side of the screen and look at me, you would have, you would have seen, as Ken talked about, I love getting up and down. And I couldn't help but start to smile because I was like, I, I recognize that feeling. I, I love yeah. this knee wedge shot. And when you see yeah. oh, man, I'm feeling kind of warm and fuzzy inside of the <laughs> Yes. that's beautiful yeah and 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 the paradoxical thing is if i don't hit at least one crappy shot on my way to the green i'm not going to have a chance to get up and down preach brother so think about it uh -huh. yeah uh, that's so, like i mean you, you you never know what's what's going to happen and if you love getting up and down you miss a green it's just hey an opportunity to do another thing that i love yeah Friend of my, a friend so, of mine, really good golf instructor, I, I respect highly, um, Brady. Um, he talks about a bad shot as an OTE or an opportunity to excel. And 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 I'm I'm certain as I share this back with you before we get to point number three in the journaling, uh, where you would agree with that because it's like taking the bad shot and turning it into a positive. It's like, look, I can go and make something of the situation. Now I can, I can turn the negative situation into a positive because I have this opportunity to show off who I am now, skill wise or personality wise, whatever. Yeah. the case may be. Yeah. For me, it's, it's right there with making a birdie. Look, I, I, I love hitting a great drive. I love hitting a, a great approach shot. I love making a birdie that, you know, the, the occasions when they, when it does happen and I love getting up and down and believe me, I get more opportunities to get up and down and around than I do to make birdies. Yeah. Hey, uh, so, help me here. Cause like I said, like I said to you before we turned on record on this, I said to you, look, I listen like a fan and like a player and my mind starts going. And a lot of people as a golf instructor, parents come to me and they're like, okay, well, my youngster is starting golf. What should I do? Or my youngster is mm -hmm. into golf. How do I, how do I cultivate this passion? And I always come back with like, make it experiential. So after mm. golf, you know, if they want to go play in the sand some, let them do it. Or like I, for a while, would always make golf equate to ice cream afterwards. So so it's like when the child thinks of golf, they think of, yeah, ice cream. And, and so mm -hmm. is this the same sort of thing where it's like cultivating or at least highlighting those positive emotions within? Yeah, it... it to. I would, one of the things that I uh, use or believe in is I only practice something that if I'm having fun with it. Okay. I, I'm, I'm not practicing to get better. I mean, what does get better mean? Would, would I like to drop my handicap a stroke or two? Sure. But if you're talking about getting to the next threshold, I can practice 24 hours a day and I'm not going to be Monday qualifying for the senior tour anytime soon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I like to go out and do what I love to do. If 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 beating nine irons on the range for an hour, if that if that fills me with joy, I'm going to do it. Okay. I personally happen to love going out and and you know playing with the wedges, chipping and putting, giving myself impossible shots, I trying to get up and I just love that. I didn't figure that out, given uh, what the second thing that you'd put in your journal would yeah. be. Yeah. <laughs> does it does it help my game? 
probably, but does it help my game to this to the point where I'm going to suddenly become the the best senior golfer in Canada or whatever? No. So the one thing I would do for you know for us adults who are on the recreational stream and for kids is encourage them to do what they love to do. If they love to just wail away with driver, if they're having fun with it, do it. And you know what? If they do it over time, they're probably going to get better at hitting driver. And what I'm hearing without you saying as much, I guess what I'm reading between the lines, when you went to uh, your, your, your things about being playful, where you said uh, being emotionally free is kind of the tip of the pyramid, if you will. Everything's mm. coming back to finding joy in this game which can be grueling at times i mean i find it so curious <laughs> that golfers will come for lessons and they all want to get better that's the transaction mm -hmm. that's going on so i'll ask them okay what's the goal and then they'll tell me what the goal is and a lot of folks will be to like then i said to them well why do you play golf and they're like to have fun and then i quickly follow that well with like well how much fun are you actually having on the golf course and if they mm. think about that question, they're like, well, not very much. It's a grind for, I, I often joke, it's 95% pure panic and 5% pure pleasure. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Uh, and, and then they think about this, but where you helping us to be, Kent, is where it's 95% pure pleasure, even though the shots might not be going so well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to be, I want to be playful when I'm out there. Mm-hmm. And because the reality is 25, according to the handicap system, 20 to 25% of the time, I'm going to play my best golf, wh whatever level I'm at. 75% of the time, I'm going to be north of my handicap number. Yeah. So if I approach the game from the typical point of view, which is if I play well, I will be enjoying myself then I've automatically set myself up to be sour 75% of the time. Yeah. Exactly. But if I approach the game from the point of view, look, I, I'm, I'm going to immerse myself in, in the, in the, in the joy of making this swing. I'm going to immerse myself in being playful. And I'm going to try to grab a hundred percent of that. And 25% of the time, I'm going to play really well relative to my handicap. Yeah. So then I've got 125 as, as opposed to whatever the other number was like, Awesome. 25 it's just a better way it's just a smarter way for the approach the game now again how how john rom needs to approach the game or how brooks kepka needs to approach the game is is totally different than the way i need to approach it and and that's why it's, talking about the pros i think that's why people gravitated to this michael block guy in the weekend yeah mm -hmm. because I mean, look, obviously the guy's an excellent player and, and you, you could make the argument that he was having, you know, playing some of the best golf of his life. But he, he, by all appearances, he appeared to be a guy who was just really enjoying the moment. Yeah. It's not as if he posted those, the, the, those numbers with the sweat pouring off his brow and, you know, angry. I mean, I, you, know, you probably saw, you might've been right there on Saturday when he shanked one into the almost it OB went, for God's sake. It went straight over my head. We went, I was sent out. <laughs> okay. No lie. No, this was actually on Friday afternoon because CBS, we had the call over the weekend on Thursday and Friday, we did two hours relief for ESPN. And so we go out there and my producer goes, go and find block. He's like one off the lead. I do that. I, he just made bogey on the fourth hole. It was his 13th um, on the par five. Gets to the next hole. Short par three, playing easy, receptive hole. Yeah. And he gets up there with a nine iron and hit it. I, I was 30 yards off the tee to his right. He mm. made contact. This thing went straight over my head, hit a tree behind me out of bounds and kicked back into play. And wow. you could see he was a little rattled after that. But on the following hole, the sixth, which was the hardest hole, I think I've ever seen. Okay. Yeah. He stands in there into the wind, hits driver, and he's not that long in the fairway. It's a three iron in there to 20 feet. And I was like, holy cow. I mean, yeah. I was fixing to watch a complete meltdown. And, well, and this guy most, managed to reestablish the round. Most guys that I know on men's night would have been devastated or, or in a yeah. club, in, in B flight in the club championship, for God's sake, mm -hmm. would have been absolutely destroyed by that shot. And here's a guy in the biggest stage in golf. And it's 
sure, you know, there was a bit of a disturbance in the force, but as you said, he moved on. Yeah. I mean, he was he was inspirational. The only other golfer that that inspired me that much on a on an emotional level was probably I think her name was Hanako Shibuno, the 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 woman from Japan who won the uh, who won the British Open in 2019. Yeah. I mean, I I her her joy in that final round was was I, you know, you watch that and you say, "Wow, you know, that's that's how I want to experience the game." I, I I want to get to the third point in the journaling. The sure, journey. but 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 first I want to camp here for a little bit because the outpouring of love to Michael Block from all and sundry, not just the folks in New York. He became an honorary New Yorker before my eyes. It was the craziest thing, um, mm. but but just worldwide was unreal, and I kept on looking at this, going, all this is is a guy who's a decent golfer who just had a wonderful attitude, who was immensely thankful. Yes. I mean, he got in an, every interview he did, and he did every single one. He'd come in and he'd go, man, you're my hero. And he'd say to Rich Lerner, you're my idol. And they're featuring him, but he's like, oh, it's so cool to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And, and you're right. It, it was touching this emotional nerve inside of each and every one of us. And he became a hero because he adopted that stance, which to me, I said this to a colleague on the air. I'm like, this is just so out of the ordinary in this league, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think like attracts like, and I think at some, at, in some way people resonated with the joy that seemed to be in this guy's heart. <laughs> so it was a cool thing. And to, to actually be there was, uh, must've been awesome. Well, well, I mean, I, I got to call him some Sunday morning early. I was sent out with Rory and him. And uh, Rory gets there on the first hole and nearly holes out. The crowds are getting mm. honest. I mean, when they arrived on the first tee, people were shouting, block, block, block. And it was not often that Rory McIlroy is not the popular guy in the group. They were tough. Yeah. And down yeah. the and second holes, they were showing up to every shot, to standing ovations. And then they, they both, well, Rory made a couple of bogeys. Michael made a couple of bogeys. And then all of a sudden, they were kind of out of the movie a little bit. So yeah. my producer moved me to Scotty Scheffler, which was kind of the plan. Sure. If things sure. didn't go well. And then Michael just does Michael stuff. Now I'm one group back yeah. um, on 14, the short four walking up the hill. And we just hear an explosion of crowd noise. On yeah. Four. And the, there was a spectator chalets down the right of 14, right of 15 into like a right angle. And I see people throwing drinks and going bananas. And I get up the hill. I'm like, what happened? And they're like, Michael Block just made an ace. And I remember going, okay, <laughs> and the guy goes, enough is serious. Yeah. So Scotty Scheffler walks up behind me. He's like, what's happening? I'm like, Block just made an ace. And he goes, you're joking. <laughs> <And I'm> like, <laughs> so, then I get word that he flew it straight into the hole because now they're showing the shot. And I say to Scotty and Ted Scott, I'm like, he holed out. It didn't bounce. It flew straight in. And they were like, no, you're joking me. And, and it, it was just, it was a biblical, biblical sort of an experience. Yeah, and I mean his his up and down at eight on eighteen. I mean, if there was ever a if, if there was ever a shot that was willed into a putt that was willed into the hole by by the crowd, I mean, I would assume it was that one. It was it was spe it was it was really special to watch. Well, look, he is the case study for what you preach. Okay, so with that, let's get this train back on the track, shall we? Um, so you in the journaling, you're like, what am I grateful for? And I love the fact that you aren't necessarily just going into golf. It's like, man, I'm grateful that my family let me go out and play golf for four hours. Yes. Yeah. And then yeah, I mean, I'm I'm grateful that that we have staff that that set the golf course up and you know, people who cut the grass in the mornings. And I mean, it's it's not the same, it's not that I'm identifying the same thing every morning, but you know, when you really stop and let yourself think about it for a minute or two, you know, there's just there's just a lot to be grateful for. And I think gratitude is is the is the number one emotion for a recreational player like me. It might be confidence for the guys on tour. You would know that much better than I do. But for a guy like me, gratitude is the is the is the key that unlocks the door. I would counter that. And I defer to you because you're the expert in this, but I certainly would advocate, in fact, I might die on this hill, that even the professional golfer, because they have so much at their disposal and people are bowing down at their feet all the time going, courtesy car here and, you know, yeah. jet, all this sort of stuff, that it becomes like, well, this is normal. 
And but then mm. you put anyone else in their position, you put Michael Block in John Rahm's position, he's gonna be like, How about this? Free food, free drink, you know, everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, yeah, well, you would know. I I I've not been around those guys, so uh I think fair enough. Gratitude's a big deal. Um, and then you say, What do I love about golf? And there's always something, even though it's going bad, there's something that about the sport that kind of creates this emotional pathway within. And I guess that's yeah. what it goes. So what's point number three that you journal about? Well, the, the third thing that I ask myself is, is if, if today proved to be my final round of golf ever, how would I want to experience it? <laughs> and, and the answer for me is that, well, you know, I'd want to be, I'd want to be fully present. I'd want to, I'd want to take my time. I, I, if, if I managed to hit a good shot, I'd really want to relish it. If I, you know, I'd want to enjoy my playing partners. I'd want to enjoy the outdoors. I'd want to just, I, I'd want to just really be there, be present, and not be, not be locked into the future about what am I going to, if I'm, I'm on the third hole and I'm thinking about, well, what's my sc final score going to be? Or I don't want to be on the third hole and thinking about the putt that I may have may missed on number one. I just want to be be present and that's easy at my age it's easy because i mean i i got a i one of my best golfing buddies took a took a stroke in 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 january and he, and he still hasn't walked so you know like it's easy for me at my age to go hey you know what at some point not too long from now you're going to tap in your last putt buddy so uh you know let's let's be let's just experience today as if it was it and i find that those three questions put me into a good space into a, into a really good emotional space and if you think about the game as as being you know your your hands and your head and your heart well it puts my heart in the right place yeah doesn't mean that i'm going to go out and quote unquote perform you know i'm not a world class golfer you know so could i go out there today and shoot even par yeah you know i'm i'm a I'm a good club level player, but I can also go out there and shoot 88. Yeah. You know, it doesn't mean that I'm going to perform. It just means that my, my heart's going to be in the right place. And that does give my, when my heart's in the right place, it does give my head and my hands, you know, a, a chance to sync up. Um, I truly believe the more I listen to you, I think I've known this deep down, but now you've galvanized this belief for me that the sweet spot, if you will, the kind of mm -hmm. zone. It happens when a golfer is in this place where, where there is gratitude about it, where it's like, like Gary Player would say to me. And when he said it, I was like, ah, oh, Gary, that sounds cliched. Because, you know, he's an achiever and you ask for advice and he goes, Mark, you should hit every shot. And I mean every shot as if it was the last shot you were ever going to hit. And mm -hmm. I was like, okay, Mr. Player. But if you honestly unpack that, like you unpack yeah. for us, you go, you know, if this was the last shot I was going to hit, I would probably make a pretty good practice swing. I certainly would make yeah. sure the yardage correct. You know, I'd make sure I had all of the pre-shot stuff figured out. And then if it was only, honestly the last shot, I would just freaking let it fly. I wouldn't be like holding back. Yes? You agree? No, I wouldn't be trying to steer it anywhere. Uh-huh. No. Yeah. And, and what he's saying there and what you're saying are... Uh, essentially the same thing he's talking from a physical sort of a standpoint but but if it was the last shot from an emotional standpoint kind of the wellspring of who we are uh, you, you'd be in a place where like i'm gonna just make the most of this really i am yeah and i find that doing this taking the three to five minutes before a round with my journal i find that writing it makes a makes a big difference um it seems to connect your it, it seems to connect at a deeper level and doing it on a computer. And it's also not something that I'd recommend, you know, some guys have said to me, Oh, you know, can I just do this? I'll just do this on the way to the golf course as I'm driving my car. Well, no, you won't because you'll be distracted by the traffic or your phone or the radio or all kinds of thoughts are going to come into your mind. But if you just sit down, take a blank book and just, you know, write the answers to those questions, just make bullet points it does seem to help you make more of a connection. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to cultivate that state. I'm trying to, I'm trying to walk onto the golf course in that emotional state as, as much as possible. 
and you know it's you yeah. would you you would let's say it's likely but let's say things aren't going according to plan golf wise oh that know. never happens <laughs> no no gee where's what yeah. um then you would just go back to I mean, I'm I'm thinking I'd I'd even write this down, keep the little journal, the little book in my pocket, and look at those phrases and honestly just kind of drink them in a bit and let them wash yeah. over my body some to get my myself back emotionally on track. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So when I'm on the bogey, one of the things be, because I've see there's there's a difference between a, a mental technique and 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 something that you've cultivated or anchored in your heart. Mm -hmm. so if i'm on the bogey train or or you know the double bogey train um one of the things that i can do because i've done this i've done these rituals so often is i can ask myself okay ko why are you here yeah and you know automatically the answer will come well i'm here because i love hitting hitting great shots and i love getting up and down and i love and I love all that stuff. And I can make an emotional connection with that, not an intellectual connection. Mm -hmm. Because if you're on the golf course and things are not going good and you're trying to make some intellectual connection where, oh, I need, a, I, I need to have a better swing thought or I need to talk positive to myself or I don't, I need to do this or I don't need to do that. It's, it, it's all up here. And to my mind, it doesn't have an impact. Yeah. But if I've done this, if, if I've, if I've committed to doing this journaling work for three to five, even 10 minutes a day, look, I'm, I'm so far down the golf rabbit hole that if that 10 minutes a day, it's like, it's like an extra 10 minutes on the putting green, you know, like it's not, it's not a big ask, no. but, but because I've got that connection, I can, I can identify, I can ask myself that question in the middle of a round and again, it doesn't mean that I'm automatically going to start making birdies, but it does mean that that I'm not going to make a hard game even harder by by compounding it by letting my emotions run away with me and either get super frustrated or super anxious, and then I get to the next shot and I can't make the right decision on it and blah 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 blah. And then you make what's supposed to be fun, even for the, you know, I think about the competitive golfer listening to this, the same thing applies because those grind days, which are inevitable, you know, you can relish the grind. I, I often say to young tournament golfers, I'm like, if I had to look at the PGA tour player who I get to see front and center every week, mm. they, they, they sort of relish the uncomfortable, they're comfortable being mm. uncomfortable. Because mm. the closer you get to the lead on the weekend, the more uncomfortable things become. Yet this is what everyone's dreaming of. Yet when the aspirin golfer gets there the first time, they're like, oh my goodness, this is a weird place to be. And I don't feel very normal. But if you're anchoring, if you're rooting, to use your word, yourself in these three questions, you know, you can somehow find some comfort in a, in a really challenging yeah. environment. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's not it's not a... It's not a kind of it's not a sexy kind of pre-shot routine or a, or a sophisticated uh, you know mental tool. It's just you know sitting down with yourself on a regular basis and and connecting with the kind of emotional state that will allow you to potentially extract the most joy from your experience. I mean, I mean that's fundamental number one for me is I'm a pay-to-play golfer. Yeah. So what am I paying for? Well, I'm paying for an enjoyable experience. Mm -hmm. sure. So this this enables me to potentially go onto the golf course and play, engage in the world's hardest game in a way that uh, you know enables me to extract the most joy from it. So before the round, I will spend three to five minutes doing this. During the round, I just want to play. Mm -hmm. I don't want to have to have a, a checklist, a, a, you know, a, a mental game scorecard, all that kind of stuff. I don't want any of that. I just want to go out and play. And then after the round, what I will do is I'll take my journal again and I'll write down my, my best holes, my best swings. Usually it's two or three holes that I feel, Hey, you know, that, that was, that was really a, yeah. it was really, a, really a great moment. I did that. And I'll ask my, and I'll ask myself, what's my best drive? What's my best wood or hybrid? What's my best approach shot? What's my best wet shot? 
What's my, what was my best up and down? What was my best leg putt? What was my best regular putt? Sometimes I'll have, you know, seven or eight or nine things to put down. Sometimes I'll have two or three put things to put down. I just use bullet points. I don't write a paragraph. I'm not, I'm not writing a, something for golf digest, but what that does is it, is it, is it counteracts my brain's tendency to focus on the negative. And it, it gets me into the, it, it trains my brain to hunt for the positive. Yeah. Crazy. And so what I found by doing this after a while is I found that I started to naturally speak to myself on the golf course, the way that I would speak to my playing partners. So if, you know, best friend, huh? <laughs> yeah, well, if it was a great shot, I, I, I feel great shot. I mean, every now and then, uh, you know, I'll say, Hey, thing of beauty or something like I'll, I'll actually enjoy it. And if I, if I attempt a, a putt that I, that lips out as opposed to, ah, oh, you idiot, keep your head down. Yeah. It's nice try. And there's something about saying it out loud too, right? That's sort of like the faith comes yeah. by the hearing of it. Well, yeah, I've had people say to me, hey, won't my buddies think that's a little weird? And I'll, I'll say, well, hey, you know, what would they prefer? Listen to you moan and groan or or listen to you every, <laughs> every you know, going on about why did that not break left? Why did that not break right? I can't believe it. Huh? I, I hit it fat. I hit it thin. Well, really? I mean, you know, I thought it was perfect, you know. <laughs> So what would your buddies prefer? Would they prefer to hear that? Or would they prefer to hear you every now and then say something like, wow, you know, that was great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In response to a, to a great shot, which reminds me, it's kind of a little, little sidebar, but, but um, when I used to work with hockey players, if professional hockey players, if someone was to say to me, Kent, what's, what was the difference mentally between a guy who, who carved out a really successful career in the NHL and, and a guy who was, you know, a really good player, but he was up and down in the, in the minor leagues and never quite stuck. Mm -hmm. What would be the primary difference psychologically? And, and I would say that it was that the, that the guy who didn't stick would tend to dwell on his mistakes. Mm. And, and the, 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 the players who, who, who stay in the NHL, tend to have an ability to, to not make a mistake more than it needs to be. They, they'll make a bad play in a game. They'll give away a goal or whatever. And it's, it's not they don't care, but, but they don't make it this big Hollywood production that gets replayed in their minds time and time and time and time again. And, and there's a the brain has a tendency to do that because it was, I think it evolved that way as a survival mechanism. I mean, if you didn't, if you didn't notice something that was wrong at the water hole a half a million years ago, then you probably exited the gene pool. So, you know, it, it makes sense that we're wired that way. But from a golfing point of view, I mean, you hear it all the time with, with, with golfers. I, I remember, a, reminds me of a, 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 of a buddy of mine, we went up and played this golf course, hard golf course. And this guy shoots 71, one under par. At that point, his best round of the year. We we're sitting around afterwards and one of the guys says, hey, man, you know, great round today. And his immediate response was, yeah, but, you know, if I hadn't made double on 14, it would have been. Uh... I mean, this guy just played lights out, mm -hmm. but the focus was the miss. So I want to train my brain to stay away from that. I mean, I can I'm not. Yeah, I just want to focus on my best moments, focus on what I'm doing well and. Um, you know, it, it helps me, uh, it, it helps me in, enjoy the game more. So that's my journal. That's my ritual is the journal before the round and after the round. Well, I want to get to this tweet for in a second, but to the post round thing too, I oftentimes do this with a lot of tournament golfers where I have them just kind of grade every shot they hit, give it like a A, a B or a C or a D. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing at the end of what was a bad day, how when they look through it, how many A's and B's they got just because of the very nature of golf. And then they look at well, the summary and they're like, dang, I'm actually better than my score. You know, because sometimes you can play a lot worse than your score or play a lot better than your score because that's just how golf sometimes works. Well, and the opposite is true too. I was I was uh, looking at the Masters app and, uh, you know, a week or two ago, it was still online. I don't know if it still is, but I watched every shot that John Rahm hit in the, in the final round. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, look, he hit a lot of great shots, but you know, he had, he had three, four bad shots for a guy at his level. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you could step away and think, Oh, you know, John Rahm just won the masters ball striking clinic, all that kind of stuff. But if you really get into it, even the best on the planet, when they're playing their best, yep. don't hit them all perfectly. I mean, he started off in the first round. I couldn't see, uh, I should say, the first hole in the final round. I couldn't see his lie because of the because of the camera angles. But he probably had somewhere in the, you know, eight iron, nine iron, seven iron range and clearly missed the green, like big time miss on the wrong side mm -hmm. to the right of the green. Now he got up and down. But how many of us recreational players would be, you know, in a in a club championship or our or, or men's night, you know, miss the first green to the right, and then that's it yeah, we're done. for the rest of the day. That's all we can focus on. True, so true. Um, it's, this has been great stuff. I, I want to close it, and I thank you for your time with this. And folks can follow you at Scratch Attitude on Twitter. Um. You tweet, my aim in golf is to be playful when it's my turn to play, which is <clears throat> uh, being playful, of course, is being physically relaxed, mentally calm, and emotionally free. Clearly, I'm not there yet, but I've experienced the occasional glimpse, and it's so enjoyable, it makes the entire pursuit worthwhile. Put mm -hmm. a cap on the conversation with that. Well, that th that is the pursuit for me. Okay. Um, the pursuit for me isn't isn't winning some you know elite amateur championship or something like that. That's just not going to happen. The pursuit for me is you know can I really experience that that joy? I mean, you know, uh, unless you become like little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Well, what does that mean? What do little children do amongst other things? Little children are playful. If they're doing if they're playing, they're just immersed in it for the joy of it. Mm -hmm. and that's that's where i want to that's where i want to be so and for me to get there it's the the core of it the root of it is that emotional freedom that that i attempt to cultivate off the golf course it's not when i strike it beautifully and my mental game is really sharp then my emotions will will kick. Then my emotions will be positive. I, I don't see it that way at all. I, I see the foundation, the core of it, as emotional. And if I can get my my heart in the right place, then you know my head and hands have a chance to uh, to get in sync. I love that. Okay, um, folks around the world, Kent does have an ebook. It's called Scratch Attitude, An Inner Journey to Reclaim the Heart of Golf. Tell folks where they can find that, please. You can go on my uh, on my website, scratchattitude.com. It's, it's available there. Uh, if some of you are interested in some individual coaching around this theme, that, that's also something that I offer on the uh, on the website for the for the cost of a box of Pro V1s in Canada. <laughs> I figured, I feel that there's something congruent about that. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm hoping in the next couple of weeks that I'll have this book uh, available on, on on Amazon. I've gotten a lot of, uh, I'm very grateful that I've had a lot of uh, nice feedback uh, about it from from guys on Twitter. And uh, I think it's, uh, I, I think I can, I can put it out there now and, uh, Perhaps it'll it'll help some people who like to have a physical book in their hands. So well, hopefully in a couple of weeks that'll be available. Well, you have been an absolute star. I appreciate all the insights and stuff, and and you've touched something inside of me. Like I said, you've you've unlocked something I kind of knew, but you know sometimes, well, no, oftentimes it's easier to go to the physicality of it because I can just go and practice, and I can mm. just go and hit golf balls. But you know the wellspring of it all is you know in your emotions, your heart, and such, and so. You, you've 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 the way you've packaged this and described it to all the folks listening has been has been a joy thank you well thank you mark it's it's a, it's a privilege to speak with you and uh, all the best <laughs> <laughs>